you are a theoretical cosmologist. Is that what that is? Theoretical. What, what is, how does one, you know, your mother's a powerhouse. So I know you were raised in a mm. household where there was like- Margaret Prescott. Yes. Yes. Margaret Prescott. <laughs> your mom is all of the things. Um, so, but, but how did you get interested? She's an activist. She's a black woman activist out there doing these things. How did you get directed to the cosmos? I mean, it's my mom's fault. <laughs> like, I mean, my mom, you know, my mom mostly raised me by herself. And so she really does have a lot of responsibility. And, um, you know, she was interested in things that are not like part of the everyday life. Like, I think it's probably fair to describe my mom. She's, she's a hardcore black feminist activist. Well, totally there's video you can find on YouTube. I've heard just like taking the microphone away from the chief of the Los Angeles police department at a press conference. She just took the microphone and started talking. Right. So she's, she is, a powerful lady. She's also interested in mystical stuff. And so I think for her, like physics kind of spoke to that side of her. And so when I started, I, I was really into math as a kid and math is like not my mom's thing. And when I started to show an interest also in physics and how math can be brought into conversation with physics, she took me to see a documentary about Stephen Hawking, A, a Brief History of Time. And I came out of that documentary and I was like, I have to have the book now. I was 10. So my mom was like, you cannot have the book because you will become discouraged and you will never want to do this again. That book's for adults. Um, she also clearly secretly arranged for her older brother, my uncle Peter, to buy me a copy for my 11th birthday. And that was really like, that was how I got into it. And I think part of it was, you know, part of the thing about growing up as a movement baby, as we might say, like a, a child of an activist, is that I grew up seeing a lot of what was broken about the world. And I think that physics at the time to me looked like a way out of that. Hmm. 8668, oh, so I just want to give out the number of anybody listening and want to call in. The number here is 866-801-8255. One of the things I love about your book, The Disordered Cosmos, is you do something that my physics teacher in high school did, which is you, you, you sort of say what you were taught isn't true, but they teach you in the order that they learned it or the way the Western eye was on it. And you go back and you give the proper attributions to who discovered different theories, like you give the Persian person for what we know as Snell's theory. And that how our mind is trained by our education to think in ways that don't even accurately um, match what the world is. So I wanted you to give me a little more information about this. Like we think of uh, Euclidean geometry triangles, and you were talking about the Brazilians, the palancurs, and how space is actually curved. Tell us more about that thinking in this curved way. Yes, yeah, so I guess I will start by saying I think that my mind was open to the possibility of seeing things in this different way, partly because I had this like very Afrocentric upbringing, right? And so um, I, I was open to the possibility, for example, one of the things that I do in the book is a lot of times people will be described as like ancient Greeks. And then they will actually be like from Libya, like they're, they're North African. And so one of the small, in my mind, easy reorientations I do is I actually name those geographies instead of like referring to the empire, right? That's, that's an active decision that I made. And I think it reflects the way that the things that we are taught are normal can shape how we understand our reality. And that that can be something that's social, that can be affected by, you know, um, whiteness and, and the way that um, so much of our education has um, white supremacy built into it um, in this way to, to teach us to think of these people as like sort of proto-Europeans, even though they were North Africans, as, as an example. And so I think my mind was already open to that idea. And then it turns out that when we try and formulate a, a correct theory of gravity, that thinking about space as flat and thinking about space time as flat is actually not useful to us, even though that is how people thought about it for centuries, right? And we have some familiarity with this, right? Because people for a long time were like, the earth is flat. We still have some basketball players running around talking about that. That's concerning. I'm not gonna name names. I'm just gonna say, earth's not flat anyway. 
<laughs> but neither, neither is neither, space time. Neither is space, right? <laughs> yes, wow. neither is space time. And so what's interesting, actually, is that Europeans were very um, used to using this Euclidean geometry system, and we're having a hard time constructing a geometry that actually described how things moved in the sky. Meanwhile, in Brazil, there is a community, the Palakur, that um, because they were very influenced by the presence of like basically large snakes in their environment, that they, um, things that were curved were more natural. And so they had a geometric system that made more sense. And of course, we would never hear about that because like, you know, they didn't colonize everybody. <laughs> so that's not the version of events that we hear. Thank you. Oh, 866-801-8255. Is it Chanda or Shonda? It's Chanda. Thank, Thank you, you for asking. All right. That was Lindsay. Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein is here. Um, the Disordered Cosmos is her book. Chapter six, Black people are luminous matter. Mm. Black people are luminous matter. What does that mean? I am an expert on dark matter. So this is literally All right, like- So let's you, back up. Let's back up, Chanda. Yes. Chanda. Yes. This what is, is what I spent matter? my day on. Yes, right. let's is, talk about dark, it. What is dark matter? Okay, so you're looking at your Zoom, you're looking at your computer, you're looking around the room, you're going out on the street, you're seeing all of the stuff. You can see all of the stuff because it's luminous matter, it's radiating. You can see all black folks, you're giving nods, all of that, right? Um, so everything that we can see in the universe, everything that radiates light is actually like a very small fraction of what's actually filling up the universe. <laughs> So this is something that we learned during the 20th century, that most of the matter in the universe that uh, is affected by gravity is actually something that we call dark matter. So why we call it dark matter is a historical question. It goes back to Europe during a certain time period. <laughs> so I'll let people tell, read tell, into tell that. Story, because I, I feel like we have to start to undo the misinformation campaign that justified mm -hmm. this horrific system of enslavement of black people so that they could have a moral get out of jail free card, get out of hell free card. That's what it is, a get out of. So morally, these people come from a dark continent. They are savages, they're cannibals, they're ignorant, their brains are small, they're not, they're animals. So whatever we do to them, we have dominion over them because the Bible says we have dominion of all the animals and these people are animals. And so we have to erase all of the history that says anything different and change the narrative. So if we don't start to peel back all of that and tell the truth about it, then, then our children's children's children will be saying the same things down the line. So th they call the dark matter. Why Dr. Prescott? So the first place that you hear this is in England in the late 19th century. So late 1800s, people are starting to think about like, well, what if there's some, there's some kind of matter that doesn't radiate light? Well, we're just going to call it dark matter. Now, the question of, so the actual phrase dark matter doesn't actually arise until the 1930s in German um, by a Swiss astronomer, Fritz Zwicky. Um, but there are versions that sound like it leading up to that point. So the question of like, why do they associate dark in, in this way of, um, of, of having a color, first of all, when it doesn't radiate light, is very much related to their own relationship with the word dark, right? So I think that, that that's the, the first thing is at the same time that people are thinking in these terms, the dark continent is very much normal, everyday conversation phrase, right? And we know, we know that in 2022, there are still people talking like that, right? I, it's finally the case that I think America is starting to have to be honest with itself about that. So I don't want to pretend like that stuff is all in the past because it's clearly very much present with us. So the key thing though about this, like, and I'm putting this in big air quotes for the people who can't see about this dark matter is that as far as we can tell, light goes right through it. So it doesn't actually have a color associated with it. It's more like invisible matter or transparent matter or clear matter. So a better analogy is kind of like a window, right? The light just goes right through it. It's a really clean window. You just can't see that the window is there. 
but it's affecting how the stuff that we can see is moving through gravitation. And that's how we know that it's there. Um, and so, it's most of the universe. It is most of the universe. It's most of the normally gravitating matter in the universe. There's also something called dark energy that similarly, there's no reason to call it dark energy. <laughs> Like it's not actually dark, I am, but it's called dark energy because there was already a dark matter. That's basically physicists uh, like like the familiar. I think is is maybe the the thing that happens there. And so, in the case of dark matter, one of the interesting things that has happened is because it was portrayed as something that was genuinely dark, that there were some black people who were like, oh, well, maybe that's an analogy for us. Maybe we are the dark matter. And I kind of hear that. Like, I hear why that feels like, you know, claiming something that feels like magical and mystical. Um, but the problem is, is that I'm a theoretical physicist who works on dark matter. <laughs> so I know, I know that we are luminous matter. And that that's actually really important, right? Because we also have these like, cops and vigilantes like running around being like, oh, well, I thought the cell phone was a gun. And they have this like magical shape shifter idea about black folks. And so I, th I think that we have to ask the question of, of what does it mean to read ourselves through that story? But OK, there's so there's black folks doing that. But then the thing that actually set me off was that white physicists started comparing black people to dark matter. And then I was like, no we are not doing this, we are not doing this. <laughs> and so really, I, I wrote the chapter Black People Are Luminous Matter because I wanted to talk about the fact that we actually are the same star stuff. Um, and that's, I think in some way, that's my version or that's a version of Black Lives Matter that we really are. And that's not, I don't, it's not like, you know, we all bleed the same blood, like it's all red. Like, I don't want it to be heard that way, but really to be like, it is enough for us to be luminous matter because the cosmos are amazing. I want to sit in that. We're, um, this is the month that we're celebrating Octavia Butler. Mm. I'm actually, uh, we're starting to read in Nubia, which is a space that we created. Um, uh, Parable of the Talents, Parable of the Sower. We're going to start that next Monday with Dr. Gray Carr. I cannot wait uh, to reread it with a thousand plus people. I can't wait. Um, the way she saw the world, and that's Afrofuturism, which is not science, science fiction, was prophetic. <laughs> like she mm -hmm. was able to see because time is not what we think it is, right? And I think things are happening in time at the same time and you can tap into i believe that we can tap in when we tap into that that luminous matter that we're made of that we have access to things that we don't have access to in this flat world that we're in with the flat thinking so, so talk a little bit about and dr chanda is here dr chanda prescott weinstein her book is called the disordered cosmos a journey into dark matter, space time, and dreams deferred. We'll get to the dreams deferred as well. But talk about our ability to traverse time. Do you see? T tell me what your thoughts are, because I think we can. You know, the interesting thing is that the place that people want to go often is like magic or incantations. And I will say that that's not my area of expertise. Like, I'm just going to be real honest about it. That's not my area of expertise. But one of the reasons that being a theoretical cosmologist is cool is that essentially what we do is look back in time and we tell stories about this. And I mean, like literally look back in time. So to help people understand what this means, right? So probably most folks have heard that the speed of light is finite, right? So um, it, it doesn't go infinitely fast. It's not instantaneous. It takes light time to travel from point A to point B. So it takes light about eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. So if you look at the sun and you shouldn't, it's bad for your eyes. But let's say you are foolish and you look at the sun. <laughs> you are looking at the sun eight minutes ago. So by looking at it, you're actually looking at past time. So on cosmic scales, we can do this for very long periods of time. So there's actually light that's in the universe that has been flying through the universe since the universe was only about 400,000 years old. And we can see that light. 
So we're literally looking 13 billion years into the past. So we really are, in some sense, time travelers, thanks to the way that light travels through the universe. And the universe is expanding as it's doing this. And so we can learn about what's in between and, and all kinds of cool stuff. So that's my take specifically on, on, you know, that's another way of looking at time and thinking about how we can, how we can relate to time. Um, you know, I think Black thought, I mean the rapper, I'm a big Roots fan, but also Black thought more broadly, I just got to put that out there, <laughs> huge fan. Um, but more, more broadly, Black thought is a powerful instrument that folks have used throughout the centuries, regardless of the conditions that they were in, um, to craft and to, to world craft. And so, you know, a lot of people are turning to Octavia Butler and have been for the last few years, um, partly because people are finally starting to realize they should be reading Black women authors, which like way to catch up. Thank you for, for joining the crowd. But also because there is this whole generation right now of Black women writers who were influenced by Octavia Butler that we are so lucky to be living with in the time of. And so I'm thinking about Tracy Dion, who's the author of Legendborn, which is like a beautiful Black girl magic um, novel. It's the beginning of a whole series. There's definitely time manipulation in it. Um, it deals with racism. It deals with slavery. It's a beautiful book. I'm thinking about Jordan Ifuego's Ray Bearer, which imagines, um, it's kind of like, it's not Wakanda, but it imagines like a whole um, alternate universe kind of. And so, and, and I'm reading, actually I'm reading Echo Brown's The Chosen One right now, which is also a, a very gripping um, novel with like magical elements to it. That's also about, you know, what it means to be a black girl at a, a fancy private college and, and the ugliness of the white supremacy and all of that. We are living now really with Octavia's children. And mm. that is part of how we are going to get through that moment and, and, and one of, how we're going to get one, through this moment. Tanana Rivdu uh, is another mm. uh, who introduced yes. me. She actually introduced me to Octavia Butler through, through our, our uh, you know, connection. And I didn't know about Octavia Butler except through Tanana Rivdu, who has you know, my soul to keep good house and uh, living blood and a bunch of others that, you know, just opens your mind to the possibilities on Twitter. There's a, a brother who is into his, his, uh, his name is cold underscore 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 way. He says, hi, Karen, Tanya, Dr. Chanda. Um, I'm into cosmology, space science. I'm a science lover. And I want to know, do you think that scientists will ever be able to build a space travel vehicle that can travel at any level close to the speed of light and get to the okay. near star, near, the, the nearest <laughs> star, nearest star. So I guess I will say, I always like to joke with my friends that this is the one way in which I'm a deeply conservative person, <laughs> which is that I actually don't think that we're going to work out a, a near speed of light travel. I'm very cynical. I am also like a hardcore Star Trek convention attending Trekkie. Uh, so I'm open to the possibility on one, on one side of my mind. Um, and you know, like I love Michael Burnham, like all people should, uh, she's such a, like an amazing character. And so I'm excited about the possibility of that universe. I don't see how we can make it happen. Um, but also never say never because physicists are, are always like that can't work. And then someone comes along and makes it work. So I think this is a point on which you can be like, She's conservative about it, but maybe also she'll turn out to be wrong. And I'm good with that. I'll just say I'm good with being wrong. Okay, I'm, so I'm, watch, I'm sorry. I'm watching The Man That Fell to Earth uh, right now, loving it on HBO and the good. possibilities. And I feel like the people who would be in charge of creating this would be the wrong people to, to travel in time. And I don't want, <laughs> like if Elon Musk was able to do that, I don't think he should be the one traveling in you know what I'm saying? It should be you, me, and Tanya traveling in time and doing what needs to be done. You know what I'm saying? All right. I just please don't send apartheid Clyde like anywhere in oh, the time travel machine. Oh my god! So, do you know the writer Ted Chiang? 
I do. Yes. So I'm a big Ted Chang fan. So I start thinking about um, the stories of our lives and this the Fermat's principle that light, you know, travels at a specific speed. So the light knows where it's going to go before it leaves where it is, which he uses to tell a story that says all time is right now like the past the present the future mm. there's the possibility of knowing all of that like you're saying we can see light from 300 billion years ago why can't consciousness actually perceive it in all directions because consciousness isn't bound by matter hmm that's it like that's an interesting question about like, I don't know, is that a philosophy question or a psychology question? I feel like one of the reasons that people become physicists is because philosophy was hard. <laughs> 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 we're like, well, we're but, like, we just like take the hammer of the equation and like hit it. Somebody else can worry about what it all means. <laughs> but I feel like every time I hear that physicists have discovered a new particle, I think, well, didn't you all say that whatever you're looking for, you're, you know, matter changes according to the question that's asked is it going to be a wave is it going to be a particle that you all are looking for something and so then something appears you're looking for something else and the universe lets you have whatever you're looking for it's going to give you an answer based on the question you ask the universe just manifests what you've asked for so you as long as you keep looking more answers are going to come because that's consciousness that is at work when you ask the question it mm -hmm. is consciousness that is not matter so Tanya, what I'm hearing from you is that you're into history of science. And in fact, you have your own theory of how scientific yes, discovery happens. I think she <laughs> That's does. That's what I'm hearing. I think you do. But, but to her point though, I read um, in some book that the brain cannot find an answer for that which doesn't exist. So any question that you have, it has to exist or that question couldn't be, you couldn't have a question for it if there wasn't an answer. And I guess I, what I will say, my work as a theoretical physicist is a lot of it is coming up with ideas that don't describe reality and checking to see if they could describe reality. And I think that this is a place where it really runs in parallel with the important work of Afrofuturists. And I should say and acknowledge Tanarive, I'm certainly, I think I, it would probably be fair to say that the authors that I named were also influenced by her, right? Yes. Um, I, the, 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 the thing that they do is they construct what might not be and might never be, but give us a place to think about who we are and what could be. And in some sense, that's also what we do in theoretical physics. We come up with ideas, we make predictions about what they would say about the universe if they were correct. And then we go out and look for the data or we you know, rib our experimentalist friends and say, can you please compare this? your data to our theory to tell us if it's wrong or right. And then if the, the data doesn't line up with the theory, then we have to be like, okay, we're moving on. And so I, I, I really think like our job is to live at the boundary of what is known and unknown and push that forward. And that means being wrong. So it's important to be comfortable with that. <laughs> But here's also my question. So physicists are looking for this future, what else there is, but we also know that physicists still can't figure out how the Egyptians built the pyramids. When we moved some of those temples, we couldn't time them right. So they had, they didn't have all the technology we have, yet they could measure stars and measure things that were happening with the way bodies were moving. We haven't even reached a level of, you know, 6,000 years ago. So what's that about? So I actually think that there is probably some pretty clear uh, engineering explanation for for how that happened. So I don't I don't worry so too much physics. about that. I mean, okay. it is. I'm I'm going to try not to insult the engineers by saying that they're applied physicists, but I will just say that you have to go back to physics at some point. They all have to take some physics classes as part of their education. So it is physics, but it, it is an engineering problem at the end of the day. Those are the people who think those problems through. It is true that there's still a lot um, about how, like, there's a, we still have a lot of questions about galaxy formation. How do galaxies come to form? Why do galaxies rotate the way that they do? Why um, are there, uh, so each galaxy lives in, um, we think almost every single galaxy lives in a dark matter halo. So in like a bubble of dark matter, right? Um, 
there are some dark matter halos that don't, don't have galaxies inside of them. And we don't know how many of them there are or, or what that distribution is. So those are problems that I'm actually actively working on in my research right now. I don't think it's a knock against science that we don't know all of these things because like, what would we do with ourselves, humanity, if we knew the answer to everything, right? 